Hi, my name is Adam Levine and I am Assistant Curator of European Art. I am so pleased to welcome you to today's Art in the Spotlight. The Art Gallery of Ontario is built and operates on Anishinaabe land, which has also been home to the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. This territory has been a gathering place for Indigenous people since time immemorial. I am so pleased to be in conversation today with digital artist James Kerr, also known as Scorpion Dagger. Before we begin, I want to thank the TD Ready Commitment, our lead sponsor for talks and performances, for genuinely support, uh, generously supporting this talk. If you have any questions as you watch or want to reach out to us, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of our screen. James, welcome to the AGO's digital realm. It's so nice to be in conversation with you today. Uh, how are you today? I'm good, Adam. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. It's a it's a real treat. I'm a big fan of of your um, of your creative output. Um, I think we have lots in common. Um, we chatted a bit last week and uh, affirmed this, but I think you know we're sort of both interested in um, how art of a very specific period lives in the present day and how it sort of well we're sort of in a wacky moment um, for uh, maybe that's inelegant, but it's true. Uh, we live in a, a weird world and, and you, I think, are a weird guy, if you don't mind <laughs> my saying it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so tell us a bit about, well, for one thing, I've never, I, I failed to ask you the first time, what, um, where does the name, your, your gnome de plume scorpion dagger come from? Uh, it's essentially me, it's like my friends refusing to give me a cool nickname. That's where it comes from. Like I used to work a landscaping job. We'd like doing landscape construction. And one day we were just all kind of like shoveling gravel and moving it from like one end of a property to another. And we thought it'd be funny to have like real tough nicknames. And I suggested that my nickname be Scorpion Dagger and nobody wanted to call me that. So we kind of made it a point to keep it alive. <laughs> and well, sure enough, here we are. I love it. And so this yeah. became the, the your, your name for your artistic output um, as a digital artist. Um, I think the project began in 2013. Is that correct? Yeah, like late 2012-ish, early 2013. It really picked up in 2013. That's, yeah. Your work is honestly um, hard to describe uh, in simple terms. So I thought I would start by showing um, some of my favorite images from your early output. Um, and we could maybe with that sort of move through your career. And so here are three Instagram posts um, from 2013, um, all from March, 2013. Um, I sort of binged through um, scrolling through your Instagram and, and I went to the very beginning and, um, and you make digital collages um, that really bridge like the present, the 80s and 90s and the 15th and 16th century. Yeah, all pivotal times or yeah, pivotal times in my life. They, I mean, it's it's same, uh, to be perfectly honest, same. Um, yeah. I think we're about the same age. We were both in University of Montreal at the same time. So I'm assuming yeah. that uh, the 90s were um, pivotal for you too in terms of thinking about culture. And there is like a certain goofiness to the 90s um, in yeah. hindsight that definitely appears um, like the, the knight on, uh, on horseback with a lance that is chasing a man in a hot dog suit. Um, it like, yeah, um, just feels like utterly typical and evocative of the 90s in a way that I, I, I'm not sure I've been able to pinpoint why it is so specific. It's true. I, I mean, been preparing for this, I was looking through a lot of my old stuff and I've kind of had some like epiphanies about my work since making this. And one of them is being that like, a lot of it does speak to kind of like my upbringing in my past and like, just like that silliness of the hot dog being chased by a man on horse. It is very evocative of like the nineties and the stuff I was into in the nineties in a weird way. Well, I mean, it's not lost on me that you grew up um, in the suburbs of Montreal um, mm -hmm. which is a city and region that is obsessed with hot dogs. Um, Listime, yeah. Yeah, Listime, more so <laughs> than maybe any other place I've ever been or certainly any other place I've ever lived. Uh, the hot dog is king and it just feels um, 
like he appears here in your art um, as like also a sort of reference, an autobiographical moment too. Big time. So, so <laughs> of the nineties, um, there is definitely like a Beavis and Butthead vibe to some of the tone that you are conjuring. Did you watch a lot of Beavis and Butthead? I watched a lot of Beavis and Butthead. Actually, there's a Beavis and Butthead book back there. I'm not going to find it right now, but yeah, Beavis and Butthead informed a lot of my uh, upbringing, like in a big way. Um, I like pretty, a lot of that, like, judge humor. Yeah, no, I, I'm pretty obsessed with a bookshelf that has like a book about Beavis and Butthead, but also uh, <laughs> books on Lucas Cronach the Elder, yeah. um, Jan van Eyck. Uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder, and Hieronymus Bosch, who I think are all sort of um, uh, Belgian and uh, Netherlandish artists of the, Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance that you're referencing. Tell us a bit about the Top Gun image. Uh, well, let's see, like a lot of these are made back, a lot of these are actually made in 2012, really 2012. And this is during a time where I was trying to make one animated GIF per day for an entire year. So like oftentimes, you know, it was, just, it was a struggle to try to come up with new ideas every single day. So, so, so these were originally animated. We these were yeah, all originally. Everything was originally animated. This, uh, these were posted on Instagram back in 2013, before Instagram supported video. So that's why none of them are moving. So, um, did you have other venues? Were you active on Tumblr or yeah, on Facebook? That's where, or? I, that's where I started. It was on Tumblr. Uh, a friend of mine recommended because I would send out these short little videos to friends that were like last maybe like one or two seconds long that I would post on like on YouTube, which was really annoying for my friends because they'd hit play and it last two seconds and then I'd have to hit play again. And then one of my buddies who's way smarter than me suggested that I export them as GIFs and post them to Tumblr. And that's when I started the Tumblr. And it kind of took off from there. Are you trained as an artist? No, not at all. I mean, I grew up you know, my mom had me in oil painting classes when I was a kid and I was always kind of surrounded by art. And then uh, in university, I studied history and politics. Like I got my BA in poli sci, but I always hung around with the art school kids. And so while I was in university, I, I was asked to join an art collective that my friends had started, like my art school friends. And so that's when I got into collage. And well, I was doing more of like a paper cutout with glue collage, but I was doing that as a poli sci major. And we were having shows as this art collective and showing around Montreal. We had a gallery at one point. See, this is like, it fulfills everything that I thought of about the cool Concordia kids when I was at McGill. <laughs> was that you were all an artist collective showing your own spaces. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and we were not, we were not that cool. Um, so, yeah. I mean, well, I'm actually, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated to learn that you were specifically learning oil painting as a child because, um, you know, it's, it's, Oil painting is not only a difficult uh, technique compared to tempera, um, but it's also, yeah. you know, what really differentiates Northern Renaissance artists from Southern Renaissance artists, right? The, the mm. use of oil paint um, and, and sort of glazes in oil paint that um, really are the sort of like technical and, and um, uh, practical sort of boundaries of the artists that you lean on heavily in, in your collages. So that, that's really interesting to sort of see that um, in some ways you were trained to do this work since you were a child. In a way, I mean, the, the art classes that the oil painting classes that I was in, are like I, it was like we'd work on a painting, like we'd go to the park or the arboretum and paint some trees. And then we'd show up the week after and the paintings were complete. So we think like the, the teacher would actually go around and finish our paintings for us. <laughs> and it was really funny growing up, um, like you'd make a new friend and you go to their house for the first time and you'd see that they were at the same art, they had the same, oil painting classes you and they'd have the exact same painting on the wall. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so that's, I really like that. Yeah, um, I kind of wish she never finished them for us. You know, I would have liked to see what I have made back then, but. Yeah, no, I can think of a number of reasons why you wouldn't want um, like your childhood art teacher to <laughs> editorialize your six-year-old work. Yeah. Um, so these three images are um, really fabulous because I, um, like, I think there's a way where when you um, say, like, first look at that, you know, that image of the Pope in a, his papal tiara as a luchador um, mm -hmm. in a Mexican wrestling context, it can feel like, um, uh, like 
simply goofy, but I think um, your work is like extremely self-aware in terms of its its substance as um, art on the internet um, and sort of confronting this boundary between the very old and, and the very, very new. And all three of these images um, made me laugh out loud um, in terms of how they make, um, they sort of play with this, this uncanny of the 16th century um, and, and the 21st century. Um, just starting with the middle image, um, you know, seeing a, uh, a donor depicted from, you know, a, a religious man in, um, in a 16th century painting um, wearing a Google glass. Um, and also this is 2013, right? So the Google glass is yeah. really, well, I mean, the Google glass, glass never really panned out effectively, but I think this was the moment where we were sort of being told that we would start to see things like this all the time, people walking around um, <laughs> yeah. wearing these. Um, and it's funny to me because you know he's in prayer, and so there's this there's this interesting I, premise of like what is he actually looking at? Um, well, the, in the animated version, you get to see that. What is he looking at? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of upsetting me. <laughs> I think it's he's okay. At food? He's asking for food? I don't remember. You I like it a lot. It was probably pizza. Everything had to do with pizza back then, but. Well, and I, you know, I. I when we first talked, I mentioned to you that around the time that the Google Glass was first unveiled, there was an episode in yeah. France that um, was widely reported that like a man was just walking down the street using a Google Glass and a crowd beat him up because they were so outraged by this sort of like bionic robot development. You know, they, they were yeah. freaked out and it just felt so deeply medieval. This behavior was so radically medieval and so um, it, this, this, your collage here really reminded me of the, the, the like deeply medieval mm -hmm. responses to the idea of wearing a computer on your face. I love that um, story. I wish I animated that story. It's not too late. It's not too late. <laughs> it's not, it's I not should. too late. <laughs> Want to collab? <laughs> uh, I, I, if I could, I would feel very lucky to collaborate with you. Um, also because like, I think we have a lot of the shared cu cultural references. I mm -hmm. didn't, with the image on the right, um, I, knew that this was about Stephen Harper before I saw the Polaroid image of his face. Yeah. I recognized him simply from the silhouette of his hair. Yeah. Um, like just immediately it, it conjured um, uh, like the way his hair always looks. Um, and I just thought that that was it, like A, specifically of the moment, but also B, yeah, it, it did always feel like flame retardant and <laughs> and perfectly quaffed in a lab so that it could, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's see how many times that happens. It happened a lot. Um, and then of course, yeah, the idea of Adam and Eve um, flirting via Instagram comment is just, it's, it's all too good. Yeah, that um, was actually my first, I think that was my first commit or my second commission, like my first editorial piece that I did for Vice Magazine or Vice, yeah, the website, I forget which one it was, but. It's also really astute because like one of the things that comes with the hypernaturalism of Northern Renaissance art is certain details like pretty grotty fingernails um, in yeah. paintings. And so to have you zoom in on that uh, in this way and to frame it is um, <laughs> like you observe aspects of Northern Renaissance art that I, as someone who's like dedicated decades of academic study to Northern Renaissance art never zoom in on because like I don't really have the time and space I think to yeah. do that and you catch things that like I spend a lot of time looking at hands and feet and just like these features like I have a, a file I should share it with you sometime it's just hands and it's this oh. massive file it's just all these different hands that I've cut out and saved and, and make an amazing poster one day like hands I would love hands. that and there's also like you know there's a great academic tradition of this too right like um there's an Italian uh, art historian who lived in the 19th century called Morelli, who um, you know thought that you could sort of like identify an artist for you know an unknown work just looking at details like the hands or the ears, the ear lobe as these like sort of subconscious signatures or autographs that like an artist would make the hands the same way or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's funny that you also like cued in on this. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was 
it was like for practical reasons too, because I use so many different hands. So I was just, instead of cutting out a new hand each time, I just have a place where all the hands were, you know, but. I really like that. Yeah. And I, I have the same thing for feet and I have another thing for faces that I've collaged together, you know, like noses and eyes and ears and chins, cheeks. I'm going to look for, um, I'm going to look, I'm going to follow up with you to look at your archive. Um, and mm -hmm. I will say there's like a, Beyond it, sorry, I, I think I kind of, that shows my own biases. I, I immediately clued into the art historical connection, but also artists did this constantly too, right? And in, in say like we could think about the work of Rubens. We often see that like faces reappear or gestures reappear because he's looking at the same models that he's drawing from over and over again. And so many great artists throughout history have used this sort of repertoire or archive of hands or feet of, or these images um, that appear over and over again. I'm going to, from now on, I'm going to look for multiple things <laughs> yeah. appearing in your work. Um, think, yeah, feet are often very, like I use the same feet, like probably the same six feet, but yeah. I Go can't on. wait. Sorry. No. And so um, this is a bit of a hodgepodge slide because the two on the outside are references to uh, great living artists, Marina Abramovich and David Hockney. Um, and it's, it's, just there's a way where the severity of the you know like Marina Bramovich it, it presents herself in an extremely severe recognizable way um and the figure that you've collaged her with has such a deer in the headlights um silliness to it that I think it's just it, it makes this like wonderful um sort of in joke uh for the art world um, and then, I mean, frankly, the, I, I've never really, yeah. No, I use that. That was my avatar or sorry, my profile image for a long time. So and that I, was Scorpion Dagger. That was way. Scorpion Dagger for a long time. Yeah. And that's kind of like how I felt. Yeah. That was like right around when I got introduced to her work and I mean, I have a lot of feelings about her work and like most positive, you know, but I thought it'd be really funny to kind of bring her into my world. Well, I think, you know, there was the, um, there was a major retrospective of her work at MoMA um, around this time. And she like really re-entered the consciousness in a yeah. big way. Um, mm -hmm. And she also did a speaking tour around the world. And I think she probably, she definitely came through Toronto around this time. I saw her speak in Toronto um, in 2013. And I think she was probably in Montreal. So there's a way where we all came to like reacquaint ourselves with Marina Bramovich around 2013. Um, and the Hockney is just fantastic. Um, one, well, I guess here's a, a question that I, I should have asked you a long time ago. Um, Monty Python. Big time. Um, yeah. Big time. Yeah. I, I, I didn't put two and two together until the work started kind of like started going somewhat viral on, on Tumblr where people would make those comments, but I grew up watching a lot of Monty Python, you know? And so it, I think that, you know, that collage style, you know, that Terry Gilliam is, is pretty evident. Like, I don't know if it was a direct influence, but the humor was definitely there. You I mean, can, yeah, the cannonball um, yeah. is, 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 is pretty Monty Python. Uh, I've actually resisted a bunch of times having a giant foot come into frame and squash something. I've thought about doing that so many times, but I've resisted it. I think that's interesting because, you know, you're drawing on all of these like um, diverse reference. Um, and it's interesting because they're at once like Monty Python and Beavis and Butthead have a lot in common, but they're also like, I think from a class perspective, totally different. Oh yeah, big time. And um, and so I think that is one aspect that like does come up in your work, right? You localize, you're sort of a kind of a, a hoser character, uh, like an, uh, um, yeah, there's sort of like a drinking beer in a, in a clearing kind of vibe to some of the work. I mean, that's pretty much how I grew up was, you know, hiding in the woods in the suburbs, drinking beers and rolling, skateboarding around with my friends. Yeah, wearing flannels, heavy flannels. <laughs> Did you do karate? Because there's a lot of like wrestling, karate, martial arts. 
I did judo for a year, but there was no like, you know, chopping in judo, I don't think. Um, no, well, I so never did martial arts. So the chopping, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, the center image of chopping is, um, is Lucas Cronach's portrait of Martin Luther um, right around, I mean, you know, in the midst of the Luther's reforms and the Protestant Reformation, yeah. um, being judo chopped um, by Adam with Christ, yeah. with Christ <laughs> cheering in the heavens. Um, where is the skull from? Like, where's the interior uh, an anatomical drawing from? I don't, it was probably, I, I probably Google image searched you know, an anatomical drawing. I don't, I don't think that's from a, that's probably, no, for sure that's not from a painting, but. Did yeah, you grow know. up Catholic? No, no, I didn't go to church. I went, I went to a Christian summer camp for two summers, for two weeks. I don't remember, but they never, I never really, it's because my friends went and that's yeah. why I went, you know, but I never went to church. The only times I went to church as a child were for funerals and weddings. You know, and that's about it. And I always thought it was really boring. Uh, but it, I love the Christian camp. That was a lot of fun as a kid. Actually, one summer I came back and I put a big cross on my skateboard, but that lasted <laughs> not very long. I mean, that's also but, like, no. that really does represent some of the Venn diagram overlaps in your work, right? Like to put a cross on a skateboard <laughs> does sort yeah. of feel like very early scorpion dagger. Um, yeah. I skateboarding right with a cross on my skateboard, listening to Slayer on my Walkman, you know, it's like. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it, it's inevitable with the reference points that you're drawing upon to like, you know, uh, so much of the work that you're looking at is um, being produced at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and it, it's inevitably gonna be quite religious. You're looking, you're drawing upon a heavily religious society. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, in many ways, Montreal is a, like, uh, I don't know if it's a heavily religious society. It's a society that's it was. shaped by yeah. histories of religion. And yeah, that's like, it. Um, so, like, you have, I, yeah, I mean, it's just very much yeah. like the There's city a depreneur and a church on every corner, you know, especially in these neighborhoods. And, yeah, the church was really influential, you know, up until the Quiet Revolution in the 60s. And then it's kind of waned since, you know, like, I went to a Protestant elementary school, but there was no really, like it was, a, it was an afterthought teaching yeah. religion. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't prevalent at all growing up. I mean, it's funny because in the, yeah. in the 16th century there, and, and throughout, you know, throughout history, there have been a number of moments of like, um, of popular movements against the papacy. Um, but there were often in the Protestant revolution, uh, reformation, it, revolution, yeah. Um, yeah. It's like very satirical images of the Pope um, that make me think that this, the luchador image like isn't totally unprecedented, um, you know? And, and so it's, it's very funny to me because um, I think some of your work actually sort of dips into like a very, very, very long history. Um, well, this uh, has been a, a lot of your early work but we do have some more we can look at some of I just wanted to say that, like a lot of that stuff was around the time when I, you know, cause at first I wasn't using paintings. I was just kind of grabbing images from anywhere and using those to make the animations. But once I fell in, you know, I kind of fell in love with like the early Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance, especially I started, you know, I was using these paintings and I was like, I should read about them. I should like learn about them a little bit deeper and find out what's going on in them. So, it, you know, not always, but oftentimes, you know, with the karate chop with Luther, it's somewhat intentional. Like I'm trying to tell, you know, an intentional story there, but other times I'm just using the characters because they're fun, especially a lot of the patrons, you know? And, and I, think, I think there's a way that, you know, many people think of um, painting from this period as being sort of um, unflinchingly serious, but, uh, but certainly with Bosch and Bruegel, yeah. Especially, you know, they're they were extremely playful, uh, fun loving. They made a lot of room for humor and play in their work, and yeah, and, yeah. for sure. So, so let's switch. We have some other images yeah. um, that we'll pull up. So we're gonna look at some of these now later works that are moving. Well, this, uh, yeah, this is one of the earlier ones actually. This is the first one, the first painting that I animated, and it was the Giotto painting. Yeah, it's um, uh, Giotto, um, one of the sort of like 
earliest Italian pa painters of the Italian Renaissance, um, a very heavily serious image, right? Christ taken down from the cross, um, his family and friends gathered around his corpse crying with a chorus of angels mourning and pulling at their faces. Um, and, and you really went to town. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, and, and you know, like I, I, I like it quite a bit. And, um, and it's also like, um, contextually, like I, I don't mean to harp on, on Montreal, but it is one of the like places where you can absolutely sort of get away with, with this kind of humor. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yes. Sorry, go on. No, I mean, tell me like, um, you sort of, you dabble a bit with Italian Renaissance, Northern Renaissance, and I think you sort of landed largely in the Northern Renaissance. Um, what interested you about the Italian Renaissance before you went North? Um, that's a good question. Um, Cause when I was doing, this is back when I was doing one a day, every day, and I would, like one, one of the ways that I came up with um, finding inspiration is I'd come up with these themed weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think the week just prior to this one was, you know, 80s wrestlers on motorcycles. So I take these like images of 80s wrestlers and I put them on motorcycles. And then I decided to just do yeah, early Renaissance, like Johto paintings. Cause I saw, I saw this image and I thought it would be really funny if I had Jesus doing sit-ups, you know? I mean and it's also like it's just also perfect you know the idea of all of them sort of as trainers shouting at him to push harder the way you've animated <laughs> all of them to speak in unison is is really it's very good and this is you know it's funny because back then uh tumblr had these limitations on the size of the files you could upload the size of the gifts you could upload and it was like under a megabyte and which often meant that it could not be longer than maybe like eight or ten frames so you'd have to make these really short, punchy animations to get them up as a GIF. And there'd be so many times I'd make something, like I'd work all evening on something and then I'd try to post it and it would be too big. You know, it wouldn't work. So you'd have to like scale it back and scale it back mm -hmm. until you actually got it to a point where it would upload. And yeah, I think this is like one of the first ones that I had that trouble with. And I think I had a lot more going on in it before I had it scaled back to just the eight frames it's very funny. What's the next image we have? I think it was the second one. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I mean, yeah. that's the other thing is I was going to say that yeah. like metal and rock um, yeah. undergird like a lot of your work, um, which I think is is um, really fun because I also I mean I will say that um, I think as as much as we've had in common up until this point, I think this is where we diverge. A lot of your <laughs> musical references are lost on me. Um, but I do love the sort of like pastoral mosh pit that you've produced here. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that, that Jesus is from another painting. Oh, he's definitely, that's from a yeah. baptism because you can see that his feet are sort of shaded in oh. and that would have been his oh, yeah. second okay. half um, underwater. Yeah. Um, which I'm, uh, that's something that's definitely one of my favorite things is how artists of the middle ages and the Renaissance um, depict this exact episode because they they often have to like that's a that's a complicated visual effect right like seeing through water mm -hmm. um and and a like christ's body half submerged so you even see it looks like it goes a little past his guitar which is sort of oh yeah, yeah. unintentional i, I like, like to say that was, i like to say that was intentional but it wasn't no i mean it's it's all mm -hmm. um and i mean the the cheetahs um, or leopards are also like that. They're very like metal, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, is that there's even like a pig head on the ground? Yeah, this is a treat. So, um, yeah. were you presenting these at this time with music, or was this just sort no, of? No, this is all silent as a gift. The music only came in once uh, Instagram started uh, hosting video. And I would post these as uh, movie files, as move files on Instagram. And I just didn't like how they were just so silent. And I was like, why don't I just start adding music to it? You know, because the technology or, you know, the, the I, it, Instagram hosted it. Like I could have 
I could finally put sound to it. I yeah. mean, I could have always done a video with sound before, but I was always in love with the GIF. But I would yeah, say that this is a GIF where, like, I feel like my brain definitely supplies the music just by looking at it. Yeah, you don't need help with this one. No. What's the next one we have? Oh, this is yeah. very. <laughs> I like this because this is also sort of your, you have a, um, a, a, a pen and ink drawing on top. Um, yeah. And, and you've collaged painting on the bottom. So this is, you know, this is, I think there's like a, a very fun, um, yeah. you're like flirting with the, the boundaries of, of the different forms of art here. Yeah this, yeah, this is like when I started mixing the paintings a lot more and using more of like a, a varied, you know, taking more work, like now, you know, I take, like I can have an animation that would have, you know, like 20 or 30 different paintings in it, like all mashed together, you know, and this is kind of like right around when I started doing that. And that's why I included this one because. Uh, yeah, I think it's very effective. Um, I like it, uh, I like it very much. What is the next one? Oh, I, I'm pretty obsessed with this. Yeah, that's me every morning. Yeah, I feel like, um, yeah. <laughs> well, for starters, the fade to black, I think is a really important aspect of, of how this is operating, but there's also... Um... That's, see, that's the thing with the GIF that I became obsessed with too, is that I wanted, to, I hated how people would post these GIFs that would just jump at the end and start over. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted them to kind of flow from one, you know, from beginning to end. So it had this like infinite loop. And this one, I just had to figure out a way to get the guy back into bed to start it over. So fade to black, you know, it was kind of the easy cheat to do that. So is this a sleep paralysis demon or is this <laughs> just like morning as uh, this, allegory? This is morning as allegory. This is the smell of coffee getting me out of bed in the morning. Okay. You know, I often go to bed, like I'll be up and I'll be like, I want to go to bed because I want to drink coffee tomorrow morning. Mm. That's how I think, you know, it's like, I love my morning coffee that much. I, yeah, I, I could not, and I will not function without coffee. I'm not interested yeah, in, me neither. in it. And no, thanks. This is very fun. Yeah. Um, the also, I mean, the, the sort of googly eye quality of it is also. And this kind of, you know, I don't know if this is the first time, but I really like putting these faces on inanimate objects and giving them, you know, personality. And it's something I do often now. It, uh, he does feel a bit like um, the man in the hot dog suit too. Yeah, big time. Um, oddly, it's like one of my earliest memories is I woke up as an infant in my bedroom and everything was talking. Mm. You know, I had this like weird waking dream where like all my teddy bears were talking, all the paintings were talking. And I, yeah. yeah, I was recently um, babysitting my two-year-old niece and we had lined up all of her stepped animals and I was coming up with voices for them. And, and I did have a moment where I was like, what am I teaching here? <laughs> <laughs> but like, not, like what? what? What exactly am I modeling? Uh, what are people getting here? But, yeah. but there's something sort of romantic about- I like um, that. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. So yeah, under the bed too. I don't know if you can see it, but on the bottom left corner, the, under the bed, there's an Ulala magazine. Yes. That, that makes uh, appearances often in the work too. Different issues of Ulala magazine. Is, is it a real magazine? No. Well, no, not that I know of. But, yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I, I I know that you said. Uh, more Beavis and Butthead than The Simpsons, but your art does have this, uh, a sort of full world that you've built, mm -hmm. uh, full of like recurring characters. It does sort of like reward uh, loyal viewership. Who like when you start to see the same sort of. Um, uh, yeah, I love it when people like, you know, some of my followers comment on the characters and they have relationships with those characters. Like that gives me so much joy. It's, this is, it's, yeah. it's, and I think, yeah. have you noticed that people have been more responsive than, this is, this is my inference, but like, you know, yeah. are people sort of more responsive during the pandemic and, and while people are at home and more like glued to their phone more than before? 
I am, uh, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, but um, yeah, in a way, like I, I feel as if my interactions with people, you know, after I post or seem a lot more involved, you know, the, the questions, you know, or the comments are a lot more thought out. And like, I like, I love interacting with people, you know, like I'll answer everybody, like I'll have a conversation with anybody. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm just more paying more attention to it or, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I, I wish I've been posting more during this pandemic, to be honest with you, because yeah, I find like a lot of the interactions have been really genuine and a lot of fun. I do think, I, I also find that people have been, um, yeah, more genuine. Um, I think we've all been sort of brought to, uh, yeah, a place of a little bit more candor. And um, so uh, one of our viewers asks, uh, James, who is your favorite artist from the periods that you source from? And Adam, what is the music that you'd attach to medieval paintings, historical or contemporary? Um, I'm gonna let you start. Um, who is your favorite? of the painters that you that you were uh, probably writing. Bruegel yeah yeah just you know I, I just like the the everyday life like the slice of life of the work so so you yeah. reference specifically Peter Bruegel the elder uh, yeah who's a 16th century painter um yeah. there are many Bruegels um we actually have actually, yeah both his kids right yeah yeah and then and then yeah. uh Jan Bruegel the elder is a 17th century painter okay um, I just yeah. clarified because we've got also we have a few of the Bruegels represented in the AGO collection. Ah. Um, but Peter Bruegel, the elder, um, I think, and along with Hieronymus Bosch, are sort of these like two yeah. artists yeah. of the, the, the Netherlands in the 16th century who really engage in this like, this like <laughs> densely packed landscape with tons of little figures actively engaged in sort of high and low um, in terms of like, uh, devout religion and like debaucherous scenes of like men, you know, during carnival, uh, like peeing outside against against the um, the door of a pub. See, James, I told you we talked about public yeah, relation today. <laughs> um, and Bosch, I think, does a bit of that too. But but we can sort of parse, I think, and maybe in the next slide. Well, that's. Uh, I think the next slides are example. Like my, not this so, one. I yeah. but sorry, let's. Yeah, maybe we can come back to this one because I really love this one, but do you mind advancing to just one more slide? Um, so one more? I, or? Yeah, I think the next one um, will have more yeah. karate though. That's good. So um, this is, yeah, very Breuglian. Yeah, this is very inspired by Bosch and Brutal. So let me make you all my kids. Yeah, after the music, let's go. Let's, Um, so wow. So James, what did you make this for? I made that for the Bavarian State Opera. So that was for their, uh, I guess, 2019, 2020 catalog. And we did a, a bunch of images that were, so it was actually for the printed book. I was just looking for it. I think it's in my office, but it was for the printed book. And uh, we brought it all to life with uh, augmented reality. So you could flip through the book and use your device to watch it all animated. So this was the cover for that. And a lot of these characters are characters from the other posters I did for the other ballets and the operas that season. Amazing. I mean, they, they, I already see some recurring characters. There's this alien yeah. that we've seen a few times. Yeah. Is this a hot dog or one of those things that are outside of car dealerships? Like those... <laughs> It's a hot dog. Okay. A lot I of hot tell dogs. If it was like that dude, yeah. you know, the... I've done um, that dude, yeah, I've done him too. I, a guy banging. I do a lot of hot dogs there. Eh? I, it's, yeah, they're all steamies. Um, <laughs> they're all steamies, yeah. They're all steamies. They're not all dressed though. They're from Orange Julep or from Bell Pro? Always right. LeFleurs, LeFleurs. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, this is definitely Breug Breuglian. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe more than Boschian, actually, because I think there's something oh, that okay. we see a lot in Hieronymus Bosch is that, you know, of his works, so many of them are set in outdoor landscapes, and there are sometimes groups, um, but more often than not, there are like s groups of two or three spread amongst a you know a larger landscape. Whereas Bruegel is very much interested in in many cases in the city. Mm -hmm. um, 
and he often packs crowds of people in a city. And so, you know, the the painting that I always used to, I, I, that I would always teach and that I reference the most when I think of him is this battle between carnival and land. Such a great um, painting. Yeah. Sorry? Such a great painting. Yeah, no, it's amazing because it's, <laughs> it's also a really interesting painting because it transcends time. It's one panel, but it, it's supposed to be the month, you know, the, sorry, the period of carnival and then the month of Lent and sort of comparing these two lifestyles of how people live during carnival, Mardi Gras, um, and then Lent. Um, and there is absolutely this like carnivalesque mode um, that you have here in this painting uh, with the hot dogs. And also like, I don't know what those, that variety of sunglasses, are. like it's not a Ray-Ban. I don't really know. Yeah, what I don't is. know either. I just really like them. Yeah, no, I mean, they're very good. I use um, them shades a lot. I didn't watch Tiger King, but I feel like I associate those. <laughs> yeah. I have a pair of safety glasses that look like that, that I had from back when I was like landscaping. Yeah, like cutting wood and chipping stone. I bought these pair. They weren't, they didn't have the same tint. I think they were clear, but that shape I found is really- Yeah, no, I hear you. And yeah, yeah they're also sort of like uh, 90s skiing or snowboarding. Oh yeah. Um, and to the question, I've, I've, just, I've been just been putting off answering this question because it was a hard one. What music would I attach to medieval paintings, historical or contemporary? And I think, um, you know, there is like, I have this, there's this like version of medieval art that I think people think about that's very like, like it would be like Joanna Newsom or even Seeger Ross, like very like ethereal, like beautiful. But your art really reminds me that the reality of a lot of the middle ages is like not uh, like harpsichords and like <laughs> pitched voices, but that it's like cacophony and noise music and like grunge. Um, and so now I'm inspired to say Nine Inch Nails. Oh yeah, um, that's a good one. Just, uh, but that's not something I would have said without looking at your work. <laughs> but I think you're right. And then that's, that's Freddy Krueger, isn't it? With the... Oh, Jason. Sorry. Jason Voorhees, yeah. Thank you. Um, what is, we have another, uh, the next one is um, another video. And this one's, I think, a bit longer. No, this is another, yeah, this is another short repeat. There's those shades again, the characters. The that alien, hot dog is just eternal. The winner guy. Yeah, so this is like when I, I'd love to, yeah, this should be on repeat. This is a GIF originally. So I don't know why I should have saved that as a GIF. It's okay, um, I mean, it's, I, it, well, it allows us to sort of, I think it's actually kind of easier to parse a bit while it's still. Yeah. Um, yeah, the hot dog dancing next to the grill is dark. Uh, <laughs> that's bleak, to be honest. Um, the alien eating a hot dog. It's all, it's very metal. Um, yeah. So is yeah, this what horror. like drinking in the woods yeah. like a high school student was like? This is exactly what it was like down, down the street, Heights Park. This is, <laughs> it's what we're up to. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, forest parties. That's another thing, like going to friends' cottages, you know, growing up and yes, having campfire parties and stuff like that. No, this is yeah. just... Yeah, just good times. You it's know? absurd and wonderful. And I think the unicorn um, feels especially good. It's also very Mount Royal, Tam Tam. Like, if you know Montreal at all, you know every Sunday on Mount Royal, there's the Tam Tams. But just up the hill is where the real action is, with the LARPers. Yes. And yeah. That's, I, th I think yeah. that's, not every city has a weekly, like a, that active of a community of, of live action role playing or <laughs> LARPers. Yeah. Um, Sucks and, for those cities. Sorry? sorry? Sucks for those cities. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, and I think. Uh, I used to, I resisted it and for, for years when people were like, well, like you're really interested in medieval art. Like, why don't you hang out <laughs> with the LARPers on Sundays at Tam Tams? Um, and I have many reasons why I don't want to make my own foam um, medieval weaponry um, and hit strangers in the park with it. But, um, yeah. but this does definitely, um, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that your work is deeply autobiographical. You know, I'm beginning to realize that more and more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is like not an assemblage of, of random images from 
uh, art history, popular culture, and uh, space, um, and some hot dogs. This is this is James Kerr inside. I had a realization the other day that, you know, like I've I've had I had this like hole of like inspiration, like since the pandemic started, like especially since lockdown, and I was trying to figure out why. Like you know, is it like COVID like making me not inspired? And I think it's just because I'm not getting out. Like I'm not hanging out with friends. Like I'm not doing anything. And so that, that, that inspiration is just gone. And the more I look back at my work and it's like, yeah, I can remember certain moments and I can remember certain things that inspired it. And it's like, often it's like literally like the night before. And then I wake up and I can't help myself but I have to make something, you know? And These, I mean, your work does feel, um... And, and maybe it's because of the like length prescriptions of, of internet art, you know, that yeah. like a gift can only, but there is a sort of, it feels like these like short bursts of idea and productivity. Yeah. Um, yeah I wonder that's, if that's like just an effect of like how we, how we get, see the finished product or if that's how you experience it. Well, I mean, that's how I learned to do these animations. Like was that I had to make one a day and, you know, because I was working, you know, I had a full-time job for the, for a good chunk of that. Uh, I'd only give myself like maybe two hours an evening to make one. So I had to learn to like get my ID and get it out there quick, you know, try to do it as quickly as possible. Yeah. And I, I still kind of, I mean, now they're a bit more involved and they take a lot longer, but I try to find the shortcuts. I try to get from like A to B a lot, as fast as I can often, you know? So, so yeah. you've worked with the, with the German opera house I, I know you've taken sort of private clients and your work appears in advertising. Um, what has been your favorite project um, oh for a client? For a client? Or actually, what's been your favorite project? Do you have a, something that stands out as just a favorite? Uh, of maybe it's like a good time to plug something. That's, yeah. I worked with uh, these writers in uh, Australia and Vancouver uh, on the project called the Book of Daryl, and that's a it's a physical book, and they wrote it, and I kind of illuminated it, and Amazing. that's coming out uh, soon. I think it was supposed to be out for the holidays, I think originally, but it just keeps getting pushed back. But as far as I know, it's to the printers, like as of last week. And okay, that's so all, soon all to be hot off the press is the Book of Daryl. The Book of Daryl, yeah, and you're gonna get a kick out of this. It is the story of uh, a teenage friend of Jesus Christ who discovers heavy metal. You know, it's very interesting that you say this because uh, the Bible is, you know, extremely detailed. There are many details about Christ's childhood and his infancy and a ton about his short-lived adulthood, but completely silent about his teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, subject of, of many, many, you know, theories and questions. And so I'm so glad that you've offered this that. hypothesis. I filled the gap. Deep, really deep, did. deep into like yeah. into heavy metal. Heavy metal, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next image, I think the next slide is um, uh, fairly. Yeah. Yeah. Fairly My fairly last mistake. Right. So this is, um, this is 2020, right? Yeah, this is uh, back in the spring. This was uh, right near the beginning of the lockdown. It was a, um, a client that I have, um, I've got to brutalize the name, so I'll just use the acronym, SVD. They're like a clothing company or they're a retail store. They're a shop in Spain, like street brand, streetwear. And um my friend who works there, she, she wanted to do something with me. And she was like, let's do a project where we ask like your followers to describe their COVID experiences, like their lockdown experiences. And we'll take the best ones of those and we'll put them into an animation. And I thought it was a fantastic idea. And it just so happened at that time, I, I had just wrapped a contract with the New York Times doing like a bunch of, a few editorial pieces on like, you know, personalities, 
during the lockdown. So you had like the toilet paper hoarder and there's a few more in there, but you know, so it's just like all these things kind of coincided. And yeah, I decided to put them all together and make this, I call it the COVID triptych because I had to post it in three or that was the original intention into three parts, but it works better as a whole, in my opinion, you know, without the divider. Well, but, I mean, it, and it also sort of, it's nice because it, the title, because it kind of affirms anyone that, that's thinking of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights and that sort of Boschian landscape of it. disparate, strange figures that um, defy our, our, ver our, our perceptions of reality. Um, and I think when I think about 2020, now that it's coming to a close, this has been downright Boschian um, of a year. And so, uh, yeah, for me, I think it's the like smiling um, the hand sanitizer, sanitizer that, um, and especially because of the way it pans, you know, you start and you sort of just have this like stark moment when you see yeah. the COVID um, germ floating yeah. in the sky as as the sun and and it it's so slowly sinks in and then you have that smirking hand sanitizer and it's just it's all it's just right you know um, all, everything's there you have you know the guy playing the music on the balcony that was something that was happening in Montreal at the beginning they had these concerts on balconies in front of people's houses you have the the burning 5g tower because you know, and you have the hot dog without even the bun, right? So we've it's there's the sort of denuding of the hot dog throughout your career, right? You know, it, it's not a, it's it's never an all dressed, but by the end we don't yeah. even have a, the bun. We don't even have. Next, it's just going to be the insides of the wiener. That's what I'm <laughs> <laughs> insides and clothes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that's uh, maybe we are all just deep down. We're all just insides of a wiener. Yeah, we're all just. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. I'll just, we'll leave that one alone. Yeah, no, I don't think we need to psychoanalyze this any further. Um, <laughs> do we have one more image in the, in the presentation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's end on this. This is pretty good. So, The reason why I wanted to include that one is because after I posted it, I was getting these messages from somebody saying that that is them. Like, this is me. Like, you gotta, so I checked out their profile and it's a guy in Australia who roller skates topless, has the exact same haircut. And it's that person, I, exactly. And I got a, I mean, I had a, got a huge kick out of that. But I mean, the reason, I, see, that's the thing with posting these on social media and like, you know, kind of having like, I'm not gonna say a community, but like a little bit of a following is that, like I never would have found that person if it wasn't for me posting this art, you know, or making yeah. these videos. And I never, like there's just weird opportunities and these weird encounters. And so, that's what I think I love most about the project is like, just like the, you know, it's, it's not the destination, it's the people you meet along the way kind of thing. Like, it, it's so true. And I think, uh, yeah. yeah. So have you had any, um, have you had any work, like any, um, any client work for skating or snowboarding? I, I feel like those I are so skateboard. present. I did, skateboards for, I did skateboard graphics for Dark Star. Uh, that was like maybe three years ago. And that was a blast. That was like a dream come true. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I often think about like, you know, if I would have told like teenage James, like what I would be doing in my forties, you know, you'd get a huge kick out of that. Yeah doing skateboards. Yeah, well, James Kerr, Scorpion Dagger, it has been an absolute treat to talk to you and to learn more about what's going on inside your mind and to meet one of your, is it six cats? Yeah, we have, yeah, my partner, she volunteers at a cat rescue. So our house is full of cats. That's Walter, he stays here, he lives here. Thank you so much. I think maybe as we sign off, can we watch that last uh, GIF one more time it feels like we can we can all skate off together into the sun and yeah. uh combust together um yeah. thank you all so much for um 
for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon. I hope that we uh, you enjoyed uh, dipping out of the workday early to be with us and to uh, to learn a little bit more about Scorpion Dagger, who you can follow on Instagram. Um, where else can people follow you? That's pretty much it for now. Good. You know what? Keep it simple. At Scorpion Dagger. There's nowhere else. And and let's see if this GIF will play again. Or maybe we only get it once. Yeah, here we go, everyone. Thanks again. Be well. Be well, everyone. Take care. Bye.